when you and I experience a crisis in our lives, we are all prone to go down all sorts of dangerous avenues and ask all sorts of damaging questions, aren't we? You know, our faith is tested, and we often wonder where God is. Now, our control is threatened, and we struggle to entrust that situation to our loving Father. Uh, our, our perfect dreams and what we thought of as our perfect life comes crashing down, and we begin to doubt God's loving providence and care in our lives, don't we? But we've all done it. There's not a single one of us in this room that has not done that to some degree. We all continue to do it, some of us more than others, no doubt. But in this sin-infected world in which we live, we experience these heartaches and these hardships, these calamities and these crises. And in those times, our faith is stretched, isn't it? Our faith is challenged. Our faith is strained. I'm certain that many of us in this room have asked questions like the psalmist, where are you, O God? Are you listening, God? But I wonder if you've ever asked this question, God, do you even care? Yeah, that's a little different form of the same question of doubt, isn't it? All of those questions, where are you, God? Are you listening, God? God, do you even care? These all stem from a lack of faith and a swelling of doubt in our lives. But that question of God's caring is a question that actually gets at God's character, doesn't it? Not just his ability, but his very character. Perhaps you've asked yourself before, you've wondered to yourself, I know God is all-powerful. I know God hears my prayer. I know he's sovereign. But does he actually care? I know he could deliver me, but does he really want to? Does he really care enough to? Well, that's the very question that Jesus' disciples are going to ask of him this morning. As we look at our passage, as they shake Jesus awake during the midst of a violent storm, they ask him this question, Teacher, do you not even care that we are perishing? We're going to look at this famous story. I'm going to invite you to open your Bible with me, if you haven't already, to Mark chapter 4. And in this final passage of Mark 4, we see this famous story of Jesus stilling uh, the seas, the, the, the storm, and all that's going around them. We're going to look, and we're going to see the crisis that happens. We're going to see Jesus' res response to that crisis, and then the fearful and the faith-revealing revelation that this episode gives us about who this man really is. So follow along with me, if you will. I'm going to start reading in Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, they took him and them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, as we come to a story like this, I think it's important for us to keep the main point the main point, lest we go down a whole array of rabbit trails and, and make minor points the main point. So let me just give you a very quickly up front. You don't have to write it down. You can if you want. I'll repeat it a couple of times. Here is the main point that I would give you, the, Mark's point in this passage. Jesus, as both fully human and fully God, is sovereign over creation. Jesus, as both fully human and fully God, is sovereign over creation. That's part one. And part two, he displays his loving care for his followers by miraculously delivering them from danger. 
Let me tell you, say it one more time. Jesus, as both fully human and fully God, is sovereign over creation, and he displays his loving care for his followers by miraculously delivering them from danger. With that main point in mind, let's walk through the passage together this morning. We see first in our passage the context in verses 35 and 36. We begin the story in verse 35 by Mark giving us a time marker to the story. He starts and he says, on that day when evening had come. This is picking up from the previous stories, and it really gives us a picture into the strenuous day that Jesus had here in his life. This day began with blasphemous accusations by the Pharisees. It continued with his mother and his brothers trying to kidnap him because they thought he was crazy and whisk him away. It, it continued into him teaching off the, off the shore in the boat to the large crowds a series of parables. Remember, all that we've looked at in the end of chapter 3 and through chapter 4 is all happening all in one day. This has been a busy an action-packed day. Now in verse 35, Mark says, On that day when evening had come, Jesus is tired. He's had a long day. He says, let's go across to the other side. And so Mark tells us in verse 36, they leave the crowd. They take Jesus in the boat together with his followers. And then it says here that there were other boats with him. Now, I think that the fact that there were other boats joining him probably points us to the fact that there was a larger group going across to the other side than just Jesus and the Twelve. This was probably Jesus, the Twelve, and the other followers that we read about before. But either way, that's the context that we get. It's been a, it's been a long day, and Jesus takes his followers. He says, let's go across to the other side and we're going to get some rest. And we're introduced next after the context to the crisis in verses 37 and 38. Look at verse 37. It says, a great windstorm arose. Now, if you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, it's a, it's a region that is very prone to such storms. Just by virtue of its geography, it's very prone. The, the surface of the sea of, sea of Galilee is around 700 feet below sea level. It's the lowest freshwater lake on earth. But not only that, not only is the Sea of Galilee very low, but surrounding it are all of these, as it sits in the, in the middle of the Jordan Valley, on the bottom of the Jordan Valley, surrounding it are steep hills and mountains all around. And so what happens because of these steep mountains and this very low-lying lake, you often have winds being funneled in uh, from the west off the Mediterranean Sea and from the east from the desert. And these winds that funnel into this lake can stir up violent storms on a dime. And what's unusual, though, here is that this storm struck in the evening. Remember verse 35, on that day when evening had come. This is very unusual for this time. You see, the Sea of Galilee is, a, is and was a rich source for fishing. And, and so most of the fishing was actually done at night because that's when the winds usually calm down the most. But the fact that this storm rose at night kind of gives us some additional insight and picture of why these disciples uh, not only were fearful, which you would expect in any storm, but were exceedingly fearful. Because this, this is something that these seasoned fishermen were not used to experiencing. Verse 37 continues, A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. This was not any ordinary storm. This was not a storm like you or I might experience on Lake Burton, right? I remember Brittany and I and our kids were caught in a storm on Lake Kiwi in Seneca. We still talk about it to this day. We had to cover ourselves up. It was one of those where the pontoon was rocking a little bit. We weren't fearful for our life, but it was one of those where we were kind of uncomfortable. This was not a storm like that at all. I've never experienced a storm like this. This was a violent storm that was threatening to capsize the boat and sink it. Now, in contrast to this crisis going all around, look at what Mark says Jesus was doing in verse 38. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a very hard sleeper at all. 
Uh, I have to have all kinds of sound machines and fans to drown out everything because the smallest noise uh, wakes me up. But here's Jesus in the midst of this life-threatening storm. You have to imagine the boat is just rocking back and forth, swaying all over the place, and he is asleep on the cushion like a baby. And what's ironic here is this is the only time in the Gospels where we read of Jesus sleeping. It's ironic the only time we read of him sleeping is in the middle of such a storm. Jesus, fully man that he was, he had a body exactly like ours, didn't he? A body that we were told elsewhere in the Gospels was hungry, a body that was thirsty, a body that felt pain, and now we see a body that was weary and needed rest. And what a reminder to us this is here of the humanity of our Savior. We're going to see his divinity on display in just a moment, but let's just take a moment and not lose sight here of Jesus being fully man that he was. And as such, he knows the trials of men because he has experienced them, hasn't he? He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. He knows what it's like to be tired and and, and to need rest. He knows what it's like to be tempted and to try be tried. He knows what it's like to suffer and to be scorned. In his rest here in verse 38, we see a picture of his humanity. And now here at the end of verse 38, we get our first glimpse into the reaction of the disciples. Mark tells us, they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And I I doubt that it came across like that. You have to imagine, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You, You can just hear the panic in their voices, right? You can just hear the the rebuke in their voice. Teacher, what in the world are you doing? Everything around us is going awry. We're about to die here. What are you doing? You're laying on the cushion fast asleep. Now, to their credit, they do turn to Jesus in their fear. They go, they find him in the back of the boat, sleeping, and they wake him up. Presumably, we have to imagine, they thought he could do something to help them. I'm not sure what exactly they thought. I highly doubt they had any inclination that he could do what he's about to do. But to their discredit, they mistook his sleeping through the storm to be a lack of concern, not only for their safety or for his safety, but for theirs as well. So they awake him and they they rebuke him. Now to the disciples, Jesus seemed to be unaware of their plight, didn't he? And uncaring of their distress. I think this is often a picture of how we feel in life storms and difficulties, isn't it? So often we mistakenly conclude that we are all alone. That no one, not even God, knows what is happening to us. No one, not even God, knows how we are feeling. That no one, not even God, cares enough to help us when we need it most. And how wrong these disciples were and how wrong we are when we have such similar thoughts. Now, we can, we can somewhat understand the disciples' question, can't we? We can somewhat understand their concern and even their misunderstanding. These disciples, remember, they had seen a lot in the life of Jesus, but they didn't have the full picture of who he was. Sure, they had seen him perform miracles, They had seen him forgive sins and equate himself with God. They had seen him declare that the kingdom of God was at hand. But remember, these disciples, they did not yet have the full picture. Uh, Though their faith was, was still lacking and their doubt was still wrong, we can at least somewhat understand it, can't we? But what can we say about us? What can we say about us in our own fears? and our own doubts, and our own questions. Certainly we cannot give ourselves the same sort of slack that we give the disciples, can we? Because you and I, we have been given the full revelation of who Jesus is. The full revelation of all that he has accomplished. We have the full testimony of both his humanity and his deity. We have the full picture of his finished work 
work accomplished, a work that consists of him living a perfect life as the God-man that he was, a, a work that we know led him to the cross to suffer an agonizing death for the propitiation of the sins of his people, a, a work that resulted in him rising from the dead three days later, a work that ended in him ascending to the right hand of the Father where he now intercedes for his people and awaits his return. Listen, brothers and sisters, we have evidence upon evidence upon evidence of God's care and God's mercy and God's love and God's concern and God's action for us in Christ, don't we? We have no excuse like the disciples do here. They don't, they don't have an excuse either, but we have far less excuse than even they perhaps may. This was Paul's very point later on in Romans chapter 8, wasn't it? Flip forward if you want to, if you want to hold there in Mark chapter 4. Just flip forward a few books to Romans chapter 8. Paul asks this rhetorical question there in Romans 8 verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, and how, how do we know that God is for us? Uh, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? What things is he talking about? What's well, everything that he just said in the preceding verses? The fact that God is sovereignly working for good for his people, that God has foreknown and predestined his people, that God has called and justified and will one day glorify his people. In light of all of that, what then shall we say to these things? Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer is no one. Of course he's for us. Look at all of the ways he has evidenced it. And then he goes on in verse 32 and just keeps piling on the rhetorical questions. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? And you know the famous passage there at the end of Romans 8. He, asks, he, he ends by asking this rhetorical question, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? And he goes through a string of things, and the answer is absolutely nothing. You see, our Heavenly Father has loved us so supremely, continues to love us so supremely, and, and, and he proved it by sending his Son to die for us. He proved it by sending his Son to pay for our sins so that we could have eternal life by trusting in him. Listen, brothers and sisters, the disciples do not get a pass in their rebuking question of Jesus' lack of care of concern for them, but we at least get it. But you and I, we get no such pass. Does God even care? Of course he does. He has proved it time and time again. He continues to prove it time and time again. He did so in the most loving, the most sacrificial, the most wonderful way we could ever imagine. If you are ever in a time again where you are tempted to ask this question, if you're in a crisis, if you're in a hardship, if you're in a season of difficulty and despair and doubt, and you're tempted to ask this question that the disciples ask of Jesus, God do you even care? Remind yourselves of these biblical truths. Remind yourselves of the multiple ways that God has shown his love for you in Christ and continues to show his love for you in Christ and let those reminders quell and just completely smash any doubts you may have of God's loving and gracious care for you. So we see here the context. We see the crisis now, following the disciples' question in the midst of that crisis, we see in verse 39 the command. The command. We read verse 39. And he awoke, that being Jesus, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And just imagine being a witness to this in person. You know, one minute you are preparing to say your final goodbyes to everybody on the ship because you just know this is the end of your life. And the very next moment, everything is perfectly calm 
after your rabbi, the man you're following, says two quick words. And just notice the power of these commands here. The change in the circumstance, the the change in the storm is not affected by any prayers. It's not affected by any sort of magical incantation, but simply by the authoritative word of Jesus. You see, just as the Father produced order from chaos in the opening verses of the book of Genesis, so now the Son produces order from chaos simply by his authoritative word. Now, these words that Jesus uses here that Mark says he uses are, are actually very interesting in verse 39. Strictly speaking, the words that he uses are characteristic of, of that of an exorcism. It says here that the, the wind is rebuked or, or censured. And this is a Greek word that's been used twice already earlier in the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 1, verse 25, chapter 3, verse 12, both of these in the context of Jesus rebuking an evil spirit. It's a very technical Jewish theological term that means this, the commanding word uttered by God or by his spokesman by which evil powers are brought into submission and the way is thereby prepared for the establishment of God's righteous rule in this world. Now, make no mistake, lest you misunderstand me, I'm not in any way saying that the waves were possessed by demons here. Um, I'm not in any way trying to insinuate that that this storm was a demon-possessed action, not at all. But what is interesting here is that in the same way that Jesus has the authority to rebuke and have authority over the demonic world, so now we see he has that same authority to rebuke and exercise that authority over the created order. This authoritative command over the wind and the waves is meant by Mark to show us that Jesus can do what only God can do. Mark's telling of the story invites comparison, I think, with Psalm 107, verses 23 through 32, as well as Jonah chapter 1. There in Psalm 107, we read of a very similar circumstance of some who go down to the sea in ships and a great storm comes upon them. Verse 28, Psalm 107 says this, Then they cried to the Lord, Yahweh, in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves were hushed. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. You remember the story of Jonah. In Jonah, we see, the, we see God still the storms in a divine way again that only he could. You see, in the Old Testament, God alone could possess this power to quell natural storms such as this. But now here in Mark 4, we see Jesus speaking to the created order with the very same authority that God the Father does. Mark is making it crystal clear to us here that Jesus possesses the very same power and the very same authority that God the Father possesses. We we see the apostles extrapolate on this throughout in the rest of their writings. Most famously uh, that came to my mind was Paul in the Colossians hymn of Colossians chapter 1. Remember there in that hymn, Paul extols Jesus as the creator, verse 16. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Extols him as the sustainer, verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 16 again, he is the goal. All things were created by Christ and for Christ. Here in Mark, we don't see the full reality that we're later exposed to in the writings of Paul and the rest of the New Testament, but we do see a very powerful glimpse of Jesus' divine authority. With a single word, he is able to subdue the created order. Next, in verse 40, in light of this sovereign command, we see the comeback from Jesus. The comeback, the question that he comes back with to the disciples. Why are you so afraid, he asked them. Have you still no faith? You see, their fear was a result of a lack of faith. A lack of faith in his person. A lack of faith in his power. A lack of faith in his provision. And this certainly won't be the last time that Jesus questions the lack of faith of the disciples, is it? Chapter 7, in the midst of discussing traditions and commandments of men, 
Chapter 8, after the Pharisees demand a sign from heaven. Chapter 9, following the disciples' inability to heal the boy with the unclean spirit. Over and over and over again throughout the Gospels, we see the disciples' lack of faith and the resulting fear that comes from that. They don't fully understand yet who Jesus is, and naturally so. He hasn't revealed everything to them. But he has revealed enough to them for him to rebuke their fear. To rebuke their fear, a Greek word which means losing heart or cowardice. As you and I consider our own fear, just like with the question of doubt above, before, so with our fear, we have far less excuses than the disciples have, don't we? You see, when we give ourselves over to fear, when we give ourselves over to worry, to anxiety, We are exhibiting in that moment a a lack of trust in our Heavenly Father and in His care for us in the Son. I think of the psalmist's words in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It's a wonderful reminder for us, isn't it? Psalm 46, as that psalm begins, a wonderful reminder that is just repeated over and over in Scripture. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, verse 2, in light of that truth, what does the psalmist say he will not do? Therefore, he says, we will not fear. Because of who God is, as our refuge, our strength, our very present help in trouble. Because of that, therefore, we will not fear. And then he goes through a list of of possible uh, catastrophic events. Though the earth gives way, uh, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, so on and so forth. Though everything else around me is crumbling and failing and falling, because I remember who God is, he is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our very present help. Because of that, I will not fear. Brothers and sisters, there are many of us in this very room, even this very moment, that are surrounded by hardships, that are surrounded by catastrophes, by disasters and struggles and toils. How are you this morning responding to those things? Are you responding with fear? Are you responding with doubt, with anxiety? If so, why? What makes you respond that way? Have you perhaps forgotten who your God is? Have you perhaps forgotten Jesus' care for you in that moment? Listen, never forget the same God who has delivered you time and time again. The same God who has provided for his people from the very beginning of time. The same God who has made a way of salvation for you. The same God who sent his son to pay you the penalty for your sins. The same God who raised Jesus from the dead. The same God who has done all of that is the very same God that you are invited and called and commanded to turn to in those times of trouble to lean on him, to trust in him, to remember his loving care and concern for you. I love this quote by A.W. Pink when he writes of God's omnipotent care for his people. He says, well may the saint trust such a God. He is worthy of implicit confidence. Nothing is too hard for him. If God were stinted, he says, in might and had a limit to his strength, we might well despair. But seeing that he is clothed with omnipotence, no prayer is too hard for him to answer. No need too great for him to supply. No passion too strong for him to subdue. No temptation too powerful for him to deliver from. No misery too deep for him to relieve. May these words of Jesus to his disciples in the storm not be said of us this morning. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And finally, we're presented with the conundrum in verse 41. And what is that conundrum you may ask? Is that question that the disciples begin to ask of one another there in verse 41. This is Zach's paraphrase version. Who in the world is this? Who then is this? We read in verse 41 that they were filled with great fear. This is the third time in this passage that Mark uses this descriptive term, great, 
or enormous. It's this Greek word mega. Back in verse 37, he uses it to describe the storm that strikes the boat and the disciples. It wasn't just any storm. It was a mega storm. He then uses it in verse 39 when Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea. Mark tells us that this mega storm turns into a mega calm. And now here in verse 41, we read again that these disciples had mega fear. They feared exceedingly. They, they had great fear. And why is that? No, notice the, the progression here. They, they, they feared they were intimidated when the storm came. But when the storm had been removed, their fear intensified. Why was that? I think it's because they realize in that moment that they are in the presence of someone that is unlike anyone else they have ever encountered. And that unknown terrifies them. The, the disciples here in this moment, they are in the presence of the unexplainable. That They are in the presence of, of the holy. They are in the presence of God himself. And nothing strikes fear in the heart of sinful humanity more than being in the presence of the holy. And nothing invokes fear in man more than being in the presence of God himself. If you remember in Luke 5, Luke records a, a very different incident that happened on this very same sea, on the Sea of Galilee. And there in Luke 5, we read of Peter coming back after a night or a day of fishing, empty-handed. And he, he, he comes back and Jesus tells Peter and his fishermen to go back into the sea and to let down their nets. And Peter, he's a seasoned fisherman, he thinks Jesus is crazy. He's just crazy. Well, he, he knows what he's doing. Peter knows what he's doing. Why is this man telling me to go back out and try again? But he obeys. He goes out and he goes out and he drops the net. And if you remember, he catches so many fish, it almost sinks the boat. Now, do you remember how Peter responds at that moment? You think as maybe the shrewd businessman that he might have been that he would offer Jesus 50% of his fishing business, right? You don't have to go with me every night. Just come out with me once a week and we'll, we'll bring the haul in, right? You think maybe that would be how he'd respond, but that's not. Luke 5, we read, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. Why is that? It seems like an odd response, doesn't it? It seems like an unexpected response. He responds with fear because he realizes, just like the disciples do here in Mark chapter 4, that he was in the presence of something unexplainable. That he was in the presence of God himself. R.C. Sproul reflects on this and he writes these words. We meet all kinds of people, Sproul says, and as we meet them, we unconsciously sort them. We do this every time we walk down the street, instantly pigeonholing every person we see. Is that person smiling? He seems safe. Is there a look of fury in that person's eyes? We give him a little extra space because we know unbridled anger and what unbridled anger can be like in human beings. We separate everyone into categories, Sproul says. We, we separate them into safe, dangerous, nice, cantankerous, whatever. But we do not have a category for one who can speak to the waves and cause them to obey him. Such a one is in a class all by himself. This one is so alien, so other, that there is no compartment for him, Sproul says. Who then is this? That's the question that the disciples are faced with as they come in contact with Jesus in this encounter. And listen, that is the eternally significant question that each and every one of us in this life must ask and must answer. Who then is this Jesus? The famous atheist Bertrand Russell was once asked what he would say to God if he discovered upon his death that God actually did exist and Russell was wrong. His response was this. He said, I will say, not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. Rest assured, that excuse will not fly. Listen, the evidence is in and the evidence is overwhelming. 
Not only is the evidence overwhelming in our lives, in this world, and in this word that there is a God to whom we will give an account, a God to whom we will answer for our sin and our rebellion against him, there is equally overwhelming evidence that this Jesus of the Gospels is God himself incarnate. Who else could subdue the wind and the waves with the power of his words? So the question for us this morning is, how do you answer these two questions? Who is Jesus and how do you respond to him? Now, the testimony of scripture is that there is only one correct answer to those questions. Jesus is the perfect God man, the eternal second person of the Trinity, the Lord of heaven and earth, the one before whom every knee will one day bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, confessing that he is Lord. So how should we in this life respond to him? Very clearly with faith and with repentance, repenting from our sin, repenting from that sin that is so enticing to us, that sin that holds us so captive, that sin that is such a rebellion against God and having faith in this Jesus and this, his love, his care, his mercy, his grace and the faithful savior that he is trusting in his finished work to pay the debt of our sin trusting in his tender care of our soul trusting in his soon to be glorious return when he will make all sin go away when he will make everything right and when he will usher in the new heavens and the new earth listen if you're here this morning and you have never truly settled those questions in your mind who is jesus And how should I respond to him? I pray that you would do so this morning. Turn to Jesus. Be reconciled with the Father. Trust in his finished work on your behalf. If you're here this morning and you know the answers to those questions, you're a follower of Jesus, as most of us are in this room. You're a follower of Jesus, but for whatever reason, you have lost sight of the fullness of the reality of who Jesus is and how he cares for you and in so doing you have given yourself over to the same fear the same worry the same anxiety the same doubting questions of jesus that these disciples do here in our passage if that is you this morning i pray that you would be reminded this morning of who your jesus is of his eternal power of his infinite authority of his loving care and concern for you as his child and that you would find comfort and rest and a a sure remedy to the fear that you face. Does he even care? That's the question for us from our passage this morning. I pray that you walk away realizing that God has shown abundantly that the answer to that question is a resounding yes. You see, Mark reminds us in this passage that Jesus, as both fully human and fully God, is sovereign over creation, And he displays his loving care for his followers by miraculously delivering them from danger. That truth was was true for the disciples 2,000 years ago. And that truth is true for you and I this very morning. What a powerful and loving Savior we serve. Let's pray together as we prepare to sing a song of response this morning about the power of the cross.